that God, you're an amazing God that you are, that you never forget us. You constantly pursue us. You constantly work in us. You constantly convict and encourage and all that is necessary to draw us close to you. And Father, we pray that you would just do a great work here today. We surrender our hearts to you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move in a powerful way. And Lord, when we leave this place, we pray that you would have done such a work in our hearts that, Lord, we just, Lord, we want more of you in our lives. We just can't have enough that we desire a greater walk with you, a more rich walk with you. And Father, we pray as we open your word that your word would speak loudly, that your Holy Spirit would illuminate the words right off the page. And Father, we pray that we would be challenged, encouraged, but Lord, also we pray that we would have uh, get, open our hearts to you directly. Say, Lord, have your way in us so that we could truly be uh, worked upon, worked in, and worked through. And Lord, we also want to pray for the peace of Israel. We pray, Lord, that you would give uh, Netanyahu and the leaders uh, great wisdom in how to handle this issue with this war going on. Father, they're defending themselves. We know they're not perfect. We know they make mistakes. But Lord, we also know that your hand is upon them. Your hand is in this. And God, we pray that you would uh, allow this to end quickly. The accomplished task would be done um, quickly. And God, that you would get the glory. Father, we pray that you would protect your people. We pray for out of this, great salvation would come to Israel. Lord, that it would not delay. It would come quickly. And Father, we pray that, Lord, you you would even do a great work um, in Gaza. For those uh, um, Palestinians that don't know you, Lord, that they would cry out to you. Not to some other God, but truly call out to the one true God. Father, we pray for a miracle. We pray for you to have uh, just your way in, in this region. Lord, we just pray you bring peace to Jerusalem. And God, we just give you all the glory. Have your way in us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. First uh, Corinthians uh, eleven twenty three through 26 says, For which I received from the Lord, that which I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And he, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When we think about the remembrance, as we always take communion, we want to look back. We look back to the cross. But more importantly, I think just celebrating the resurrection last week, that we look back to the resurrection. Yes, we look back to the cross, but it's the finished work of the cross. Because without the resurrection, the cross was just another man dying. But having that resurrection, Christ died for our sins. He conquered sin. He conquered death. And he rose again. And he's waiting to return uh, for his bride soon and very soon. That'd be a good thing for a song, huh? Soon and very soon. But when you think about it, as we live our lives in such a way that if we really believe that the imminent return of Christ could come at any day, I think it would change us. And I know we all struggle with life. We have issues that come up in life. I know that we are going through what we go through. But I think if we would get back to remembering soon and very soon, the trial will end. Whether it ends in this lifetime or not, I don't know. But we do know this. If Christ returns today, no more trials, no more suffering, no more tears, no more pain, no more, no more anything evil, no more wickedness but ultimately we'll be in glory with the Lord, sharing in His glory. So when you think about remembering Him, we remember what He did so that we could have salvation. He goes on and says, In the same manner which He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Passover supper was what Jesus was uh, participating in with the um, disciples. And as he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, don't forget. Don't forget. He had longed for this time to meet with them, but he says, don't forget. Remember what I'm doing for you. And as they had been prepped and prodded by the Lord over and over again that his death was coming, but his, ret- his, his uh, resurrection would be there as well, they should have been looking for that as well. But he says, as often as you do this, drink this, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death. And, and, and when you think about the, the juice, the bread, the bread is symbolic of the, 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 the beaten body of Christ and the, the juice is the symbolic of his spilt blood for us. But something is remarkable when you think about it. Jesus says, do this, this do. As often as you do this, he says, this do. But do it in remembrance. Do it for the right reason. 
And as you do it for the right reason, you're proclaiming the death of Christ. Think about those who hear about the death of Christ. We had Resurrection Sunday across this land, across this globe. Many came to Christ, hearing the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. From Good Friday, from Palm Sunday to the Resurrection Sunday, that Christ came and paid the price for sin. And here the Lord tells us to remember. Remember what he did for us. And you think about memories. We're going to talk a little about remembering the past here in a moment. But you think about memories. I have some great memories. I think of my mom and my dad. I was looking through. I'm, I got a new phone because my phone died on me or was almost dead. Wouldn't charge correctly. Uh, back was shattered. So I get a new phone. Now I have to put all that on the new phone. So when I downloaded all the pictures, it gave me pictures that I hadn't seen in a long time. And I was seeing some pictures of my mom and my dad. And uh, just old times and remembering those good times. I remember back to my mom and, and thinking about how she took us to Sunday school. She'd get us on the bus and take us to church. We took a, a church bus um, near our home and would go to, go to church. And, but, so we remember those things. But I think the greatest memory we can ever have is that we have been saved. We have been bought by, uh, uh, by the blood of the Lamb. That our sins have been paid for. That we're no longer guilty. I mean, not guilty as you pound the gavel. Not guilty. Price is paid in full. Your debt is no longer owed. Christ took it and paid for it in your stead. And what a great memory. We could look back to that and say, man, of all my stupidity, of all the things that I've ever done wrong, Christ came and paid the price for me. And I think even that, that memory is something that no matter what we, f- we may forget in life, no matter what we, good memories we've had in the past, that maybe even forget those memories. This one should never be forgotten. Christ paid the price for us. Amen. So when we think about the the, the resurrection, we think about what Christ paid for us on the cross. He says, as often as we do this, we proclaim his death. That's our testimony that Christ died for me. Christ paid the price for me. So as long as we're taking communion, as often as we do it, we try to do it once a month, the first Sunday of the month. Others do it every week. You know, some people may do it every day. Who knows? But the bottom line is this, as often as we do it, didn't tell us how often, but as often as we do it, we're doing it in remembrance of Christ. We're not doing this or we're not, let me rephrase this, we're not partaking of what is about to take place here before us just because everybody's doing it. But we're doing it in the sense of it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He paid the price for my sin. And each one of us should be having that mindset. We, we, we remember our salvation. We celebrate communion because of our salvation. And we proclaim the death of Christ and resurrection of Christ until he comes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that, Lord, you have given us this symbol of the body and of the blood of Christ. That you've given us this uh, uh, command. Jesus said to do this as often as we do it in remembrance of him. And Jesus, we can't say thank you enough that you paid our price. You were sinless and we were guilty. And Lord, you took our praise. You took our sin upon you. And as darkness overtook the land, when you hung on that cross and said, it is finished, all that was necessary to reconcile man back to God was complete. Jesus, you took our place and we say thank you. And as we hold this bread in our hand and reflect back upon what we've been forgiven for, all our sin. All sin that we've ever done, ever will do, past, present, and future, Lord, you paid the price for it. And we just can't say thank you enough. And as we take this bread now, we celebrate communion. We say thank you for paying the price for us. And Father, as well, we think of the shed blood. And you tell us in your old covenant that that shedding of blood was, was necessary. That folks would have to bring their animals to have that blood to go and and be in their stead so that their blood wasn't uh, taken. But the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus came and shed His blood. And His blood didn't cover our sin. His blood erased our sin. Washed it away, made us clean from the inside out. And Lord, we just say thank you so much. Jesus, thank you for dying for me, giving us this new covenant, this new uh, covenant in in your blood, this new agreement that we can have life eternal in you. And we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink the juice.
All right, if you would, open your Bibles to, um, my computer's uh, going into stubborn mode. You guys didn't know they had a stubborn mode on computers, did you? Yeah, they do. Well, maybe I do. You, you might not. All right, Isaiah 46 is where we're at today. Um, title of today's message, There is only one true God. Only one true God. Um, second, or subtitle is Remembering the Past. Psychologists will tell us that you need to reach back and bring up your past in order to have healing. Well, in a way, maybe. But so often they'll blame, you know, how you're, you were treated as a child as a reason for your actions. Mommy didn't burp you well enough. Didn't change your diaper off. Excuse after excuse after excuse. Now, I'm not discounting uh, psychology and psychiatry. I'm just making the statement that, you know, looking back to our past isn't always the answer. But today we want to look back to our past, just as we talked about in communion, that we want to, as Christians, remember where we came from. So we don't necessarily need to be looking back to our past in such a sense of mulling over our past sin, going over this and trying to remember, oh yeah, I remember I did this, and oh, I remember I did... No, no. What we need to remember is that what we used to do in sin has now been forgiven by Christ, if you're a follower of Christ. That He has forgiven you. He has justified you. And that word is a, a theological term of, guess what? Just if I never did it. That's the easiest way to remember. Justification is that just if I had never committed that sin. Christ paid the price for it. Christ washed us clean and made us new in Him. So when we think about our past... Yes, we have a past, but our past before Christ is important to understand that we're no longer that person. And that's a great spot for an amen. I'm not who I used to be because of what Christ has done in my life. And I'm grateful that Christ is still working. I know my wife is grateful that Christ is still working in me because I'm not going to stay the way I am now. Sometimes he, he, you see him build you up encourage you and and grow you and other times you see him allow you to get broken down so that he can bring humility in your life and you can be totally surrendered to him sometimes you see where there's just all kinds of issues going on in your life and he just will swoop you up in his love and you feel his comfort and his peace either way it's God working and God never works in meaningless ways everything God does in your life has an intended purpose and it's for your good and for his glory Romans 8, 28 says, And now we know all things work together for good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. His purpose is the key. We have been called according to His purpose, His perfect will, His perfect plan, and in His perfect timing, God will bring it all about. So when we find ourselves being disciplined under the hand of the Lord, rejoice because you're a child of God. When you find yourself being encouraged, rejoice because you're a child of God. When you find yourself going through a trial after trial after trial, rejoice because you're a child of God. And you know what? God's using it for your good. Sometimes it may be hard to see. How could this be good? God? How could me going into this sin be any good, bring about any good? We think, well, 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 how would sin even be any good? Well, he says, and we know all things were together. Whether it's a trial or a temptation that you fell into and, and sinned, God uses it all. Well, I'll tell you how he can use it all when it comes to sin. He can use the sting of the consequences to open your eyes. I don't want that ever again. It's just like when a child gets disciplined by his father. My dad knew how to bring about enough sting for me not to remember how much fun I was having, but to understand, hey, that's not a good thing. Stay away from that. I remember a time in my past, and I know this is silly, but my cousin had come over, my, my dad and my, my uncle were out, and my cousin and I were watching baseball and we decided we were going to be pitchers I think we were like nine or ten years old and we took charcoal briquettes from the used charcoal briquettes from the barbecue and our neighbor had a red brick house so their wall was right next to ours and we were being pitchers and we were throwing those so there was black spots all over this wall my dad came home my uncle came home and my uncle was a big man so he had about a four foot long belt and it was real thin, and he pulled that thing off like a whip. And my poor cousin, oh my goodness, my cousin Sammy got it. So I think, I think my dad, because my cousin was getting it so severe, decided to whoop me too. But let me tell you, he whooped me. I've never thrown charcoal briquettes at my neighbor's wall ever again because the sting was greater than that fun of the sin. And that's what God does in our lives. He brings enough punishment or, or enough discipline in our life to, hey, I don't want this anymore. 
but he also brings enough grace to show us how much he loves us. His grace is greater than our sin. And Paul talked about this, shall we continue in sin that we may have, that we may have more grace? No, absolutely not. I just want his grace, and I don't want to do the stupid thing so I don't have to experience his punishment. Or his, I keep saying punishment, but his discipline. He's not being punitive. He's being loving and caring and directing. When you think about God's love, it's amazing. So when we think about our past before Christ, our past life before Christ, we, sh- we should see it for what it is, our past. We are for sure to use our past and our testimony. But we're never to exaggerate it, never to glorify our sin. Man, I was a rotten, rotten drunk. I was a drug addict. But guess what? God took me out of that. When I say those terms, nobody gets excited. Ooh, that sounds really like fun, you know, drunk and drug addict. But yeah, we used to party all the time and, and start exaggerating it into uh, where you're glorifying it. That's not giving God glory. You're glorifying sin, and we should never do that. We should remember that God brought, about, brought us out of darkness and brought us into his marvelous light. We should never exaggerate or sensationalize our, our sin. We just remember, I was a rotten kid. I was a rotten human being, and Christ saved me. But however, let's think about this for as, as much as well. We remember our past because of what Christ has brought us out of. When we share our testimony and how we once were, there's something that happens. We're relating to others that are in sin. We're relating to others that don't even realize how bad they are. We're relating to them in such a way where, hey, Christ can change you too. We share our testimony in such a way that, hey, I, I was like you. You know, I was, I was a drunk. I wasn't, no, don't, don't say it that way, but <laughs> I was like you, you're a drunk. No, but you just share with them that Christ brought you out of the, uh, out of the darkest of darkest holes. And you share with them that, hey, God did a great work. Christ did a great work. That gives them hope. That gives them opportunity to realize that, hey, you know, if God can save this guy, he could save me. If there's hope, you know, and you may run into people who are having so much fun in their sin, well, guess what? Until they get to that point of where they're realizing they need a a Savior, you're not going to reach them. But you plant the seeds anyway by living it. You plant the seeds by talking about it when the opportunity avails itself. But again, our true testimony gives hope to others. God did the work for every believer, and it's Him, it's in Him that He he forgave us of our sin. He erased all of our sin. He has given us new life. That's something that's hope for them. Because they're going to get to a point in their life where they're tired of living the way they're living. Why? Why do we say that? Because there's no satisfaction in it. There is nothing in sin that ever delivers anything that's lasting. Yeah, sin's fun for a season. But guess what? That fun runs into consequences. Drink and drive. What are the consequences? Fight in a bar. What are the consequences? And you could fill in the blanks. Consequences come. But what we have to realize is that when we share our faith, we share how Christ, what he took us out of, that gives them hope because they're in, those, the, the, in, that, um, in that condition. It helps them realize that we were once in their shoes, and it gives them that hope. God gives a new life. So we're going to turn back to Isaiah 45, 22, just to remember where we left off in Isaiah. And it seems like it's been forever since we've been in Isaiah, but it's only been a couple of weeks or so. Isaiah 45, 22 through 25 says this, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. If we could just sum it all up right with that one verse. You can go after all your idolatry, you can go after all your fun, you can go after this and that, this religion, that religion, but guess what? Look to me and be saved. No other God can save. Christ says if he, uh, um, that the only way to heaven... The only way to God is through Him. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He made it simple. He says, I am, he says, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God. And that's God with a big G. That's the one true God. And he says, there is no other. He goes on in verse 23, I have sworn by myself. <laughs> Why did he swear by, swear by himself? Because if you're God, you have no one else you could swear by. You swear by yourself because you're the one true God, all-powerful, all-existing, and has everything under control. He says, I have sworn to myself, verse 23, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. 
To him men shall come and shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. In the Lord is where that glory comes from, where that justification comes from. But here we, we look back to 45, 22 through 25. God has invited all people to return to Him, to turn to Him, declaring that one day every knee is going to bow. And when every knee bows at that time, as the Lord says, it's not going to be that every knee is going to bow as Jesus is Lord. Every's gonna, every tongue is going to confess that He's Lord because He is. Whether you accept Him or not, He's still Lord of all the universe. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. And you know what? At that time, his enemies will be ashamed and his own people will be justified. And oh, how we long for that day, as we said earlier, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But now, in our text today in Isaiah 46, God reminds Israel to remember what he has done for them. To look back. Remember what I've done for you. And how he's always cared for them. He's always, he also challenged them to look to the idols that they are worshiping and verify if they can speak, see, or do anything for them. And I find it interesting because we read through the, the, the Old Testament, we see a lot of idolatry. We, we, we read a lot about um, Israel getting involved with other nations as God had forbid them. Don't get involved with these nations. Don't intermarry with these nations. Why? Because you're going to become like them. You're going to follow after their false gods. You're going to turn to idolatry. And here we see God telling them, your idols are the problem. But I want you to look back to me who's always cared for you. We can look back to all the things in our own life and how God has always taken care of us and gotten us out of some crazy things even before we came to the Lord. The challenge for us is, is there anything worth leaving God for? I mean, think about it. They were turning from God to idols, to, to creations of their own. They create their own statues. They would build them. They pour out the gold and they build the mold and here I got to carry my God around challenge for us is there anything worth leaving God for is there anything that the devil tempts us with worth leaving our faith for and here's a question for all of us has the devil ever delivered on his promises to us regarding the temptation to sin come on this will be so good yeah it will be fun it will be rewarding this relationship will be better than one you have this one will be so rewarding so fruitful or this drug will help you forget all your problems. Or this drink will numb you to the, the struggles and hardships you have in life. And you fill in the blank. And we can all say, the devil's a liar. He's a father of lies. And nothing he ever says and tempts us with is ever going to come um, to fruition. It will never do as promised. Sin will never do as promised. No matter what the devil says, it will never do as promised. But here God is trying to help Israel to realize the futility of idol worship. He's helping them understand, what are you thinking? Really, you're going to uh, gonna worship, bow down and worship idols that you made? Man, it's always a good thing for God to help us to evaluate our, ourselves as well. Is it sin or is it idolatry that may be in our lives? If it's sin, we need to ask ourselves, is this sin really satisfying? Is it really giving what, ad- what is advertised? And it never is. Just remember the consequences. His point, is there anything better than me? God is going to ask them, is there anything better than me? Is there anything better in life than God himself? Is sin better than a relationship with the Lord? Do the consequences of, of sin scare you? <laughs> they should. But note this, God loves us, and the devil hates us and will tempt us to disobey the Lord. His desire is to destroy our lives, to get us to not be fruitful and effective in our life, to promote God, to promote Christ. He wants to ruin our testimonies. But now as we turn to Isaiah 46, we're going to see God asking His people to reflect and remember how He's always taken care of them and to do something about it. Now, God gave Israel another reminder back in 1 Chronicles 16, 11, 12. He said this, Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face evermore. If we could just make a, a, a life verse out of 1 Chronicles 16, 11. You can put it on your, on your wallpaper, on your phone. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face evermore. Because when we seek the Lord, we, we draw near to Him. What happens? He draws near to us. There's this great relationship that really begins to become effective and fruitful in our lives. And then he goes on to verse 12. He says, remember His marvelous works, which He has done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. Seek God and remember all that He's done for you is what He's saying. 
Do you remember God's hand in your life in your past? Is it, it is still in your life, just so you know that. And maybe we live our lives with that, with that in mind. God has still got his hand in my life, and God is still in control. All that just to preface Isaiah 46. First point is that idols are worthless. And you're thinking, but I don't have any statues in my life. But you could have a relationship in your life that gets between you and God. You could have a career that gets between you and God. You can get so focused on this or that, it becomes an idol in between you and God. And they don't have to be bad things. It doesn't have to be sinful things. But anything that gets between you and God is just that. It's an idol. It's between you and God. So he says here, idols are worthless. Look at verse 1 of 46. Bell bows down. Nebo stoops. Their idols were on the beasts and on the cattle. Your carriages were heavily loaded. A burden to the weary beasts. They, the idols, stoop. They bound down together. They could not deliver the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. It's almost like God is mock, Isaiah is mocking um, uh, their idols. Now, we have to understand a little bit about Bel and Nebo. Bel and Nebo were the gods of Babylon. And they, they, they bow as they are lowered. Here he's saying they bow. And they're bowing down as they're lowered to the ground and being hauled away on ox carts. Aren't you glad God doesn't have to be hauled away around on an ox cart? Now the word Bel means Lord and it was a title of Marduk. Babylon's chief god and Nebo is Marduk's son and and it was the was the god of fate writing and wisdom. They were heavy idols and they were expected to bring deliverance. However, they themselves were dragged away into captivity. So here God says, "I've always cared for you and look you have to carry your idols. You have to keep them upright. Yet you hear they are bowed down, strapped on an animal and to move on. You carry them, but I carry you." See the picture? If we let anything between us and God, we have to carry it. It becomes a heavy burden, and it never brings deliverance, satisfaction, comfort, or peace. It only adds a burden to our lives. And now, folks, we could have, in the sense of idolatry, we could hang on to things. We could hang on to sin. Now, when I say hang on to sin, I think of of anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. Those seem to really become a burden. You know, when you think about unforgiveness, if you don't forgive someone... Half the time, they don't even realize you've not forgiven them, and the burden is on you. You're the one struggling at sleeping at night. You're the one that gets around them, and all of a sudden, your emotions are rising up. And it's irritating. It's frustrating. It's struggling. But guess what? Why are we hanging on to them? Why are we carrying around that kind of an idol? Why are we carrying around something like that? It's becoming a a heavy burden, and it never brings deliverance. But look at verse 3. God says, Listen to me, O house of Jacob. And all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried away from the womb, even to your old age, I am he. And even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. Think about this. You're in captivity. And now they probably didn't even get to read this unless somebody was able to give them a scroll from Isaiah. But guess what? When they got out of that captivity, they'll be able to look back. Oh, God was even saying he was going to do it. They could look back after the fact and praise God because God did exactly as he said. I'm sure they, were, they praised God as they came out of that captivity. For sure. Those that came out. Some stayed. However, he even reminds them, it's me that carries you. It's me that is here for you. It's me. I'll bear you up. I'll carry you. I will deliver you. And then he asks the question. Look at verse oh, he. He says, listen up, Israel. Listen up, O house of Jacob. He gets downright specific. I am talking to you. Listen up, you, because this is what you've done. You've had all your idols. You, you, you have to carry around your idols. But I want you to know I'm the one that carries you. You carry your idol. You carry your burden. But I'm carrying you. And it's the same. Jesus says, cast your cares before me. He says, my burden is light. My yoke is light. But we're, we're trying to carry it on our own. You know, Oh, I got this. No, you don't got it. Just give it to God. Let Him deal with you. Let Him take away that pain and that suffering of trying to do it yourself. And let Him bring peace. Let Him, re- let him restore what the canker worm would destroy. Let Him bring times of refreshing. Liz and I got away this past week uh, for, four, for five, five days. Um, we just stopped. We just took a week off from work. We went to work Monday, took the rest of the week off from work, came back yesterday. 
a time of just praying and uh, seeking the Lord, but also a time of just spending time together. It was a time of refreshing. It was a time of focusing on the things that really matter. Not entertainment. Yeah, I did watch a basketball game here and there but for the, the, when she was sleeping. But the idea was just getting away and refreshing. Getting our focus and re-energized. And it's so good. And folks, let me tell you, we have a God that carries us. We have a God that loves us. Why would we carry the burdens? Jesus has cast them on me. Lay them at his feet. He goes on and asks the question in verse 5. He says, to whom? So here, here's your gods that you've got to carry around, but here am I who's carried you. And now he says in verse 5, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we should be alike? That's a question they could not answer successfully. Can your gods bring forth creation? <laughs> no. Your gods can't even stand up on their own. You have to help them. Verse 6, they lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith and, makes it a God, and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves. Yes, they worship. This is an indictment against you, Israel. Yes, they worship. They bear it on, their sho- on the shoulder. They carry it and set it in its place and it stands from its place. It shall not move. Let me tell you, if there's an earthquake, what happens? That idol's coming down. That idol's going to fall over. You remember the story, I forget the, where it was at, um, where? Dagon. Dagon. Yeah, Dagon kept falling over. They go out and pick it up, fall over and pick it up. Finally, it fell over and broke. It's pretty sad when your, your, your God breaks. You know, how's your worship going? You're bound down to a broken statue. Has he delivered you from anything? Let's think a little bit more about idols. I was thinking about this this morning um, for those that may think it's okay but they read their horoscope or they plan their around the zodiac and what's your sign you hear and they have their all those things according to their birth date and that's just gibberish guys that is just playing with sinful things we should never look for any sign from anything from man or any false god god is the one who gives the future he will tell you your future and it will come to pass And all we need to know is that God has given His Word. His Word has come to pass. His Word is still coming to pass. And you can always count on it. Stop reading Zodiacs and all of that. Palm reading and tarot cards. It's all from the pit of hell. Stay away from it. That was a free side note. It wasn't in my notes. But he says, who are you going to liken to me? He says, you guys even prostrate yourselves and you worship these idols. You carry them on your shoulder. Verse 7, they bear it on the shoulder, they carry it and set it in its place and it stands. From its place it shall not move. And look at the end of verse 7. Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer, nor save him out of his trouble. It's like, come on, money, uh, come on, honey, we're moving to Flagstaff. Grab our gods, put them on the roof rack. Then we get there to their destination. They set up their idol and bow down and worship it. Oh, thank you, idol, for getting me to Flagstaff. Thank you for getting us here safely. How dumb. Yet we can do things just as silly by putting things before God and, and not trusting God in everything. Trusting in our careers or our, our, um, our degrees. It doesn't matter how many letters you have after your name. That, that letter will never get you out of the situations that God does. That will never deliver you from the trials that you go through. Only God does. But isn't that what we're, do, we're doing when we feel like we've accomplished something? Oh, I went through, you know, through eight years of school. Now I've got my medical degree. Who cares? Heal people, you know, that's fine. But it ain't you. God gave you the ability to learn. Give God the glory. We should never take credit for anything. It's by His grace that we don't sin. It's by His grace that we get through what we get through. And it's by His, His uh, uh, giving us the ability to learn that we ever accomplish anything, and it's through Him. We should always give Him the glory. In all things, acknowledge Him. Not taking it, thinking that you've did it. He's brought us out of darkness. He's brought us uh, into His marvelous light again. We should never take credit. He is our God, period. The end of verse 7 again. From its place it shall not move, though one cries out to it, yet it could not answer nor save them out of His trouble. Folks, what He's telling them is your idols are, are worthless. And so is anything that we let get between us and God. 
It's worthless. So the first thing he says is, what do you need to remember? The one, number one is idols are worthless. But now he wants them to remember something. He says he wants them to remember the Lord for who he is. Look at verse 8. He says, remember this and show yourselves men. Recall to mind, O oh, you transgressors, O oh, you idol worshipers. He's saying, wake up and smell the coffee. He says, remember this you sh- you sh- and show yourselves men. Recall to mind, O oh, you transgressors. Remember the futility of worshiping idols that you created yourself. Recall to mind that you have been an idol worshiper. Remember that you are now moving them on an ox. They're not gods, but just a creation of your own making, and they have no power. Feudal thinking to the God of the future. He says in verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Verse 10, Declaring the end from the beginning. Oh, let me ask you, can your, wor- your idols, your worthless idols, tell you the future? Can, you tell you, can they tell you the things of old and them come to pass? He says in, in, the, in the middle of verse 10, he says, And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. No, nope. only I can do that, God says. I am God, and there's none like me. Deuteronomy 5.15 says this, Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath that day. It's like God saying, I am and there is none like me. I give prophecy and it will come to pass that which hasn't come to pass. And my counsel will stand and I will do my pleasure. And he's reminding them to look back to what he's done. Remember this. Remember the former things of old. Remember when I pulled you out of Egypt. Remember when I took care of you. Remember all the times. Remember who the fourth one was in the fire. Remember that Daniel didn't get thrown into the lion's den and be eaten, but I was with him. Remember Joseph and how I brought him through. And remember how I used him to be the Savior for all of Israel in a mighty famine. Remember Lot when Abraham pulled him out of there and God spared him and his family. Remember what I've done for you. Remember that I am your God. Habakkuk 2.3 says, For the vision or the prophecy is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And folks, what a verse for us to think about, that the Lord has said He'll return for us His bride. He says, I go to prepare a place for me that where, and I'll come and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. What a promise. Could that be today, Lord? Could that be today that you come and take us to be with you, the bride of Christ, your church? What did he say? He says here in Deuteronomy 15, he says, I'm your God, and I've commanded you to keep the Sabbath. I've commanded you to live righteous, is what he's telling them. Live holy. Live for me. And Habakkuk says, my prophecies will come true. My vision will come true. So we, we look back and we remember We remember that idols are worthless. And the things that we allow to get between us and God is worthless. It's futile and only brings destruction. But we also remember who God is. Remember Him for who He is. And with that remembrance, He's brought us out of the darkness. Now we can trust Him in everything because he's, He's done just that. He's brought us out. Verse 11. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. And this was the, the prophecy of Cyrus coming and delivering them through, uh, the, from the, the bondage of the Babylonian Empire. He conquered them. And, the, and after that seven-year captivity, a remnant did return to Israel. A century and a half later after Isaiah wrote this prophecy. But God says it's going to happen. We can trust that it will happen. It will happen in His timing. And it will happen exactly as He says. And your foolish idols can't do this, he said. Verse 12, he says, listen to me. It'd be nice if he just said it that way, huh? Listen to me. But this is the part I think applies to all of us. Listen to me, you you stubborn hearted, who are far from righteousness. This is him saying, those of you who are practicing your idol worship, those of you allowing things between you and me, those are your things that have drifted away. He says, listen to me, you stubborn hearted, who are far from righteousness. I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. 
My salvation shall not linger, or better yet, shall not delay. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. My, I bring my righteousness near. He says this. Listen to me, you who are far off. He says, I'm bringing it to you. I'm bringing my righteousness to you. And what a reminder that the Lord is righteousness. That it is His righteousness that He's imparted to us. If we've allowed sin in our lives, we need to cut it off. Cut it off. Be dead to it. Draw near to the Lord. Enjoy His righteousness, not your own, because your own is a stinky, poopy diaper. That's the best it can be apart from God. And in fact, apart from God, we can do nothing that pleases God. But as we draw near to Him and draw near to His righteousness, it's not far off and it won't delay. And He's, re- re- pre- he's predicting even here. Not only will He deliver them from the captivity of Babylon, He's also going to place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Speaking of that millennial reign when all, all of the tribulation is done and now we have that thousand year reign where Christ will rule and reign with righteousness. Listen to me, God says. Listen up. Salvation is near and will not delay. I will place salvation in Zion for my glory. And we think of, we need to really understand this for a moment. This is from the Lord, he says. Listen to me. My salvation is near. And he's talking about the salvation of redeem, redeeming Israel from the captivity, but also bringing that ultimate end to all of uh, the, the wickedness that's ruling and reigning in our, in our world today. But we can also see an application here for those who don't know Christ. Do not harden your heart as those who did in the wilderness. Today is the day of salvation. That he would say, grab a hold of the salvation, it's from the Lord. In fact, it's the only way you can have salvation is it's from the Lord. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. God poured out His mercy and grace on those who will believe. Will you believe today? If you're listening today and you don't know the Lord, it's your time. Today is the day of salvation. And in fact, at, the, at God's appointed time, the salvation of Israel will become reality and result in the Messiah's righteous kingdom. Can you imagine when we're going to just rule and reign with Christ? We're going to reign with Christ. We're going to be with Him as He's ruling and reigning over Israel and those who have gone through the tribulation period and did not reject Him. In fact, many will even um, protect Israel through that. They will protect um, those who are being persecuted from the, the Antichrist. It's God's appointed time. And I think salvation is available to all, even to this day. When we see what God has done and will do with Israel, it's the most definitely for God's glory. You think of what God's doing even now in Israel. It seems like, God, what are you doing in Israel? It's for His glory. It's going to be for their good. We're going to see them. Ultimately, we can read ahead and we can read of that thousand year reign where Christ will rule and reign with all of Israel. That remnant will, all of that remnant that's left will, and through that tribulation period, which will only be a third of what goes in to Israel, into that tribulation period, but uh, that remnant will all be saved. They'll have their eyes open. They'll look upon whom they have pierced and they'll realize that Jesus Christ is the, the Messiah and He's going to bring them into His righteous kingdom. Ruling and reigning. What a glorious time that will be. No sin. Or if there is sin, it will be dealt with quickly. It won't be this, what we see in a kingdom today, in the world's kingdom, where everything is just so upside down. It's just crazy. It's It's discouraging. It can even cause you to be in despair, but keep looking to the king. Keep looking to, not the government, but to the king. The king of all kings. But we can also see that God's doing things in our lives as well, just as he is with Israel. As Christians, what God has done for us is a time to definitely celebrate. What God is doing to us at times of discipline, for sure. Rejoice because you're a child of God. Don't don't despise the, the discipline. But then also, I think, you start thinking about your life and how you live for Christ. It's for unbelievers to see. That our life is for unbelievers to see. And it's not for them just to see and mock and persecute, but it's for them to see how good God is and He gets the glory. And many can come to Christ. And maybe you're just planting seeds by the way you live your life. And somebody else will come along and get to be able to reap the harvest. But the bottom line is this. God gets the glory. All right. I've got four points for us in closing. May we remember our past and how horrible it was apart from God. I mean, just think about it. Next time you're tempted, let it cause us to resist sin. Next time you're tempted, let it be, ugh. 
Yeah, I remember that. It wasn't the good old days like the devil's trying to uh, paint that picture of, oh, remember I used to do this, remember all the fun. You ever notice when you're tempted about those type of days that it's never him reminding, he never reminded me about puking in the toilet, about spending all my money on drugs. He never reminds me any of that. Oh, remember the fun? It wasn't fun. It was fun, worldly fun, sinful fun, but ultimately it brings destruction. May we remember our past and how horrible it was apart from God, but may we rejoice, point number two, because God brought us out of it. That's not us anymore. He brought us out of our sin. He brought us out of the darkness. And thank you, Jesus, for saving me. That's a great spot for an amen. But also, too, point number three, may we remember that God will always care for us. He cares for his people. If God is for me, who can be against me? We see the craziness of this world going all wacky and wonky and what is going on. Well, just remember, read your Bible and you'll know what's going on, that God is bringing it all to a culminating end and He will get the glory. He will rule and reign um, and we will be with Him forever. And guess what? Satan will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. I think there's going to be a Christian wave going on. All right, we're going to do this Christian wave when Satan gets cast in the lake of fire, him and all his minions and those who reject the one true God. When they, hey, God doesn't force any, there'll be no forced Christians. There'll be no forced believers. There'll be no one forced into heaven. They'll believe or not. We can always count on God. He cares for his people. And then lastly, our testimony is for the unbelievers around us who are stuck in sin. Our saved lives reflect the light. And let's let our sh- light shine bright. Remember, you're being a light to those around you. Live it out. I mean, don't get all caught up. Oh, I got to share my faith. Yes, God, uh, Christ has given us the great commission. But you know what? He doesn't want you to fear sharing your faith. He opens those doors. It's a natural thing that seems, it's supernatural, yes. But it's this, it just seems natural to be able to tell somebody about how God opens a door. You don't have to like, oh, I got to kick this door in to go and tell this person about Christ. You want to share Christ with somebody? Pray for that person. Pray hard for that person. Fervent prayer. And asking God, open a door. Break their heart. I have a friend I'm praying for. God, break his heart. Break his heart. Let him get sick of this world and start realizing that there's something better. And then he would turn to you. And when we realize all that, that God is using us tremendously. We often will say, man, I want to be used by God. You are you being used by God. When you fail, you're being used by God, especially when you come back and say, hey, you know what? I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. You know, I, I love God and I live for Him and, and this was wrong. And forgive me. If they don't forgive you, yeah, it's on them. But, I mean, think about that as a testimony. Think about it. People in the world don't do that. But you come and say, hey, I love God. I live for God and I, and I, and just, I lost my temper and I, and I blew up at you. And I, I am sorry. What a testimony that is. Two things. One is like, it's not this, oh, you're, you're holier than us. No, no, you're just like us. But there's something different because you came back and said, hey, I want to make it right. That is a great testimony to people. Now, now again, don't go around just blowing up so you can make a, a great testimony. But the idea is that we just love God and you know, love people. And when we blow it, we make it right with them. And guess what? God is going to use you tremendously. God will use your testimony. God will open a door for your testimony. I tell you what, it's usually going to be people like you. I find myself with, uh, really, when I first became a pastor, I found a lot of counseling was with people that were, come out of, that were struggling with drugs and alcohol and wild living. Well, guess what? I'm still finding myself being able to minister to people that are, I'm surrounded by people that are drinkers and partiers and living for the world, and I think the world's the greatest thing ever until they start losing things, losing the things in their lives, their marriages, their, their livelihood, and all of that. It's because they need Jesus and God will do whatever he needs to do to bring them to the understanding that he wants to save them. He loves them and he has something for them. And that's where we become that bright light of God's love. Not a spotlight that blinds them, but it actually opens their eyes to how amazing God is. All right, let's stand up and listen. Uh, let's pray before we go. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that, Lord, you are faithful. That your word is true, your word is, even your spoken word of things to come will come true. Lord, we can look forward to it. You ha- we have the past history of you always being faithful. And the things that haven't yet come true, we know will because of your faithfulness. If you spoke it, we can count on it. 
God, change our hearts and our lives. That we're, Lord, you are our, our everything. That we, if we have things in between our lives and you, in our lives that are between us and you, God, help us to remove those. Help us to tear down idols, to tear down any altars and any high places. But Lord, put you on the high place of our lives. That we would truly be bowed down to you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, change us where we need changing. Open our eyes to the things that may be hindering our walk with you. But Lord, we also pray that you'd pour out your spirit on us in such a way that Lord, we are ambassadors for Christ, that people would see how amazing you are because we love you and we're living for you. Not that we're walking around weird, we're walking around in your love. And we're loving people. And we're allowing them to see the love of God in us. God, use us mightily. Open doors for us. And Lord, change our hearts so that Lord, we can be sold out to you. Lord, help us to see the world for what it is. It's the world. It's not our home. We're just passing through and we have a job to do while we're here. Help us to be fruitful. Help us to be faithful. And Lord, again, all for your glory. And God, we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing a song before we go.